Blaster, just take it up to the departure end of the runway, then a left turn and a left downwind. Cessna over the threshold, coming up on the white dot, Adderby on the white dot, left turn first available. I got a high wind coming up on about a half mile final, clear to land, Adderby on. Traffic on the left face, you're following the Cessna down, low off your left. Square it up just a little bit, and then we're going to get you in. Start your descent, though. Start your descent on the base. Traffic on final, you're going to be follow on base. Base traffic, start turning toward the numbers now. High wing coming up on quarter mile final, take it all the way down to the green. Cessna taxiing on the green, expedite down to the next hard surface. Get me some speed, there you go, 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 go fast. This is going to be good. I got traffic on a mile final. You're following traffic ahead and to your right. High wing coming up on the threshold. Take it all the way down to the green dot. Five Charlie Sierra, two mile final. A mile final. Turn north. Turn north, and we're going to just make you. Uh, we're going to bring you back around. Jet traffic's coming up on about a mile and a half final runway. Niner clear to land. Okay. All right. Let's 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 listen up, guys. If you're on final for runway nine, I want you to offset to the left. I got a jet that's landing on runway nine. The jet's clear to land runway nine. If you can make it. If not. Just continue straight ahead. It looks like you're going around for the jet. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Oh, we had one right in front of us, sir. Dragger. Let's see. What we got? A tricycle. Tricycle. Put it down. Tricycle. Put it down. Tricycle. Put it down. Tail dragger. Down to the green. Uh, green dot. Then a left turn. Short final here. You click land on nine all the way to the white dot. Go down to the white dot. Find somebody to follow out here. Canard, just come to the runway, and I might have to just send you around. That'll be fine. And for the jet, you just want to stay in this pattern, or you want to go back out for an instrument approach? Stay in a pattern. Charlie's here. All right, just stay with me here for a minute. And my tail dragger, eh, let's see, over the numbers, go down to the green. Come on. And Canard's going to have to go around. Canard, go around. Canard, go around. Canard, right. go around. And my uh, high wing here over the runway, keep it airborne. Keep it airborne. You do not descend. Do not descend. you got a fast guy behind you. Do not descend. My, yeah, here you go. Keep it airborne. Keep it airborne. As soon as the guy behind you gets uh, slowed down, I'm going to put you down. So keep it airborne. The uh, one that just passed the white dot, make a left turn on the hard surface. All right, my uh, high wing tail dragger, you can put it down now. You can put it down now. And Charlie Sierra, let me get you about a mile off. Let's see, Charlie Sierra, I lost. There you are. Make a left hand turn. I'll try to resequence you here on the down ones. We'll see how it looks. Short final, you're clear to land runway nine on the white dot. Clear to land on the white dot. There you go. And the tricycle left on the hard surface and follow the pikeman. Welcome. Uh, thanks for being part of the show. And let's see, just find somebody to follow out the, uh, follow on the final, and as you get close to the runway, if it's not going to work, we're going to send you around and then try to re-sequence you. Now, who else got sent around that's not back on the downwind? The Canard? Yeah, Canard. All right, Canard, there's a golf stream up there that went around, too. I just lost sight of him, but you're going to make kind of a left-hand turn and stay low. I think Charlie's here once we're out, dude. 3,200. Okay, that'll be fine. Just maintain VFR. I don't know what else is up there above you. Probably most everybody's down here. So just make a left-hand turn. We'll try to get, uh, try to get you back here. Uh, Canard's got the uh, jet inside. Okay, the RV, maybe an RV-10, whatever, here on final. Keep your speed up and go all the way down to the... Uh, aim for the green dot for me. Uh, actually, keep your speed up. There's a guy behind you. Aim for the green dot, and I'm sure that's plenty of room for you to land on runway 9. You're supposed to land on runway 9. Number two... You're going to go down to the white dot. Follow the white dot. Actually, you know what? That's 1,500 feet. You're going to land at the white dot. The uh, spacing looks adequate here. Two guys on final. You're kind of tight there. Keep each other in sight, and you're going to uh, aim for the white dot. If it's not going to work, we'll do. Uh, we'll come up with a plan B. We might have to send you around. The second guy behind you yeah, out there in about a two-mile final. Are you slow enough to be able to follow that guy in front of you? You need to go around. Well, I probably shouldn't ask that because I had about five guys to answer me, so I should know better than that after 35 years, you would think, right? All right, so uh, let me see. The guy who's number one, it's number one. What kind of airplane is he? An RV type. All right, RV type. Keep it airborne for me. Keep it airborne. And I got a fast guy behind you. The number two guy over the uh, uh, trees there. Go ahead and put it down on the numbers. Put it down on the numbers. My first guy just coming up on the numbers. At the, uh, over the grass at the numbers. T minus one minute and counting. Hello. Thank you for 
Ooh, was that a bit of an echo there? A tiny no, bit. It's gone away. It's gone away. You know you only come for the production values, don't you? So, uh, well, we can we can give you that in spades tonight. Anyway, welcome to the Friday live stream on this Thursday evening. It's been raining and grey and grim all day here. Not sure what it's like outside now. Probably wet still. Who cares? Don't want to go there. Anyway, it's horrible. So, first of all, big, big thanks to the team for turning up. Thanks for you for being out there. Thanks to our guest, Mikey, who's sitting in the green room. Simon, who's going to tell us about his magnetic something or other this afternoon, uh, this evening. Um, but right now, we're going to head over to Sky Demon, uh, who we're going to thank first. Say thank you very much, Sky Demon, for sponsoring the live stream. It uh, means a lot to us. And here is your weekly top tip from Rob. Hi, I'm Rob from Sky Demon, and here's another top tip. Sometimes you'll be planning a flight to be undertaken several days in the future, and you may notice that Skydemon doesn't contain wind forecasts that far ahead. If you have a source of wind data which does stretch out further into the future, you can manually enter it into Skydemon on a leg-by-leg -leg basis. Within the weather menu, look for Set Wind Conditions for Flight, and then enter the data using the format shown. This function is also useful in cases where you might like Skydemon to assume zero wind for your flight. Like so. For more information, check out our website or our user manual from within the app. The app that just keeps on giving. It's <laughs> good stuff. It is good stuff. I guess I, I must admit it's not it's not something that I ever do like put in wind that I found somewhere because ba basically cover your cover your ears Simon if I see a wind forecast for like five days ahead my confidence level in that wind forecast will be pretty low I'd have said but you know could be useful <laughs> could be useful right in that case talking I, I never knew how. All right, things you, every day's a school day, particularly at the Flyer live stream. Let's <laughs> let's let's bring in Simon. See if we can do this. I will move you up to the top left, and I think I will put you here. Oh, is that what I want? Know. You need to come back to weather school, Ian, and I'll show you that you can trust wind forecasts five days in advance. Well, kind of, <laughs> <laughs> sort of, you know. <laughs> you're 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 right. I do need to come back. We'll get you. We'll 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 get your your confidence levels there again. Um, yeah, you mentioned my magnetics. It's very kind of you. Um, uh, Dave mentioned just before we came on about the geomagnetic storm that's uh, come off the the sun. One of the reasons for that, and I should say, it's not really going to affect us apart from we may see the northern lights, the aurora borealis, really well over the next couple of nights. But one of the reasons, uh, one of the, the the evidence for that is this. This is a solar tornado. And this is going on uh, now on the sun. And you can see it here. Um, basically what that is, it's just it, it, it's caught in a magnetic twist and it's going to move up to the north, up to the north pole of the sun. And it will eventually just eject back towards Earth. But it's amazing, isn't it, that, that we can get those sort of shots uh, from the sun. Um, whether we'll be flying on the sun? No, I don't think we will. And probably that's going to be some of the nicest weather that we'll see, at least for the next couple of days. So let me talk you through it. There is some positive news for the weekend, um, although I'm not sure that we're going to see that much of that ball of fire in the sky uh, as we go through the next few days. So this is the forecast for tomorrow. Low pressure to the west of Ireland. Um, we've got what we call a returning polar maritime air mass coming into the UK. That brings heavy showers across Ireland, across Wales, southwest and southern parts of England. They're going to be passing their way eastwards. Pretty windy as well. You can see central southern England there, the ice bars close together. So we're looking at winds generally southwesterlies could be around 20 knots, gusting up to 30, maybe even 35 in the west. So not brilliant. Few showers for northwest England, for southwest Scotland, but actually much better central and eastern Scotland, even northern Scotland, despite the front being here. And eastern England not faring too bad either. Typical basis here around about three, four thousand feet, tops about 10,000 feet. Out west, work on a 2,000 foot base of 15 to 20,000 foot tops. So not particularly fab. Now, this is Saturday. Again, quite windy across the south on Saturday. Bands of showers moving from west to east. I think flyable between the showers, although again, 
pretty windy, particularly in the morning, although the wind's easing later. Northern England, probably going to be fairly damp, fairly cloudy throughout the day. Basis here, probably around 1,500 feet, 2,000 feet. Tops about 10 to 12,000 feet across much of northern England and southeastern parts of Scotland. But I do think that kind of further west and south during the afternoon on Saturday, things probably do improve. Not bad either across northern parts of Scotland. Winds in the south, eventually westerlies at around about 15 to 18 knots, much quieter further north. And then Sunday, well, this is my pick of the weekend. Only caveat I'm going to put on this is you see the little area of low pressure here that's moving eastwards and the rain associated with it. I'm slightly concerned that could be a little bit further north in the morning, so may affect southern and southeastern areas, but it should eventually clear away. Then we get into a clearer north or northeasterly flow. So that will improve things during the course of Sunday morning for most of us. Base is around 3,000 feet, tops at about eight to 10,000 feet. Few showers coming into northern and central Scotland, possibly into northern parts of Ireland as well. But I don't think too many of these, although if we do get some, they could turn quite wintry across northern and northeastern Scotland. And also just watch for lowering freezing levels through Scotland, through northern England, as that northerly sets in. Wow, it's such a messy picture, isn't it? But I think Sunday would be my pick of the days. Really nice to see so many of you at Weather School yesterday. I've got a single place left on my uh, classroom-based aviation weather school on Saturday, the 1st of April, between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. If you want that place, go to weatherschool.co.uk and you can book that now. Phew. OK, that was a bit of a complex one, wasn't it? I'll see you next week. Have a good weekend, guys. Bye for now. Thank you very much, Simon. I always, oh, always I yeah, I always think with his weather school advert where they're all staring off into the distance, it looks like some kind kind of album cover. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember that? Do you remember that picture from Aero Friedrichshafen that, that we took on the pier last year? Yeah, that, that, that looks like yeah. an album cover as well, doesn't it? We might have to recreate that. We, oh, we've no, got a new lead it. singer this year, haven't we? The, the, famous <laughs> second, the famous second album. That's always a difficult one, isn't it? Apparently, <laughs> so they say. So they say. Right. Uh, now we've done the weather, it's time for Johnny to tell us, to tell you why you should all be a member of the club, if you're not already, that is. Yeah, first of all, because it's a bargain. At £5 a month if you want to pay monthly, or £52 for the year which in the terms of aviation is absolutely nothing. Um, obviously, for that, you get loads of free landing vouchers sponsored by Poolies. So thank you, Poolies. Yeah, thanks for providing that. Um, I can give you a bit of a sneak into next month's landing vouchers, which Sarah's prepared. So we've got Easter. Thank you, David. Bodmin, Carnarvon and Ruffham at the moment. There may well even be some more added <clears throat> between now and then. We've still got a week or so to go um but yeah of course you get access to all of the content on flyer.co.uk written video all of the other stuff live stream extra anything that may be hidden behind a paywall if you're a basic member <clears throat> so you can join and get access to all of that and also we've got we another webinar coming up next week with will flood on tuesday um emceed by dave talking about buying and selling aircraft <laughs> Um, and for people who watched the last one with Darren Lewington, his slide deck is now on the club area of the website. So if you go to fly.co.uk forward slash my hyphen account, you can find his slides there to download because a few people were asking for them. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, that's that's all going well. And then in terms of fly 2023, it's um, lo lots of people are up to some good things for it. Um, and after we spoke to Poolies, I know more and more people are thinking about how they're going to try and achieve Fly 2023 alongside and also in addition to any dawn to dusk adventures that people might have. So, um, yeah, fly 2023 minutes and visit 23 new airfields. So give Not it a new go. Airfield. Not new airfields. Doesn't have to be brand new airfields. Mm. Just 23 airfields. Mm. And, that, and, and Fly 2023 is, is supported by UAVionics, Bose, and Continental. Continental right. Motors, they aerospace, Continental Aerospace Technologies, sorry, I should say, yes. these days. So uh, thank you very much to all of those. We'll get you some logos made up for that. So that's good. I was just looking those those, because the big hope I've got is Saturday or Sunday night, I can never remember which, 
the crocs go forward, don't they? So yeah. we get longer days. And I'm convinced that after the crocs have gone forward, next week summer's going to arrive. You know, like those beautiful, still, <laughs> sunny evenings, that smell of freshly cut grass. It's just going to be amazing. It really will. I think it's going to be fantastic. So those longer days, those landing fees incorporating Bobmin and Easter, there's yes. got to be an opportunity to do the Bobmin and Easter in a day, hasn't there? I'm not sure yeah. Bob and Easter and back in a day, but maybe Bob and Easter in a day. I'd, so, famously, Paul Cadell did all six flyer landing fees in a day, and that included landing fees. Um, I'm pretty sure it included Bodmin and it included a Scotland, and that was at 85, 90 knots in a Eurostar. In a Eurostar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, I, if, if, I find, if, if, if the weather and work and everything else, it works for me. I might give that a go. Maybe, maybe not all six in a day, but maybe Bobmin and Bobmin and Easter would be a good one, wouldn't it? Anyway, mm. we'll, we'll see about that. Um, good. Thank you very much for that, Johnny. I think we're going to move over to news. We need what we need a lot that will stinger for news, don't we? And yeah. now for the news. <laughs> so let's kick that off. I mean, just scroll up to find the right picture. Dave, you're up first. Right. Well, there's some good news for an airfield. This is uh, Sherburn. It's received CAA approval for its GNS instrument approach, um, which will be active probably from June. Um, it's been sponsored by the Aero Club there. It'll be applied to uh, the main runway from both directions, runway 10 and 28, uh, to a minimum descent height of 500 feet. Um, it should go live in June. Uh, and Sherburn say they really want to take use it, not so much to uh, because they're expecting a lot of a lot of IFR arrivals or departures, but just uh, so that uh, the conditions are there uh, when, it when it should be needed. They, they, they stress they're very much a, uh, a VFR, VMC airfield in most of the time. Yeah, I think there's a, I think I've been, all Fraser Benison, who I, who I saw in the comments, uh, undoubtedly has got either some knowledge or involvement in that. Um, and I, they've been at it for something like eight years, I think. Maybe yeah. that it's taken them to get that, which, which is which is good mm -hmm. going. A bit of a tour de force for a start. And I think I, I can't remember what the yeah absolute is. Round of applause for Paul. Um, I, I think as well there are a couple of restrictions. I think you need to make sure the gliding clubs are aware of it. Leeds East aware of it. The CA is aware of it. Um, yeah. Johnny's yeah, grandmother's site. aware of it. That kind yeah, of there's thing. a glider site nearby. There's also Leeds East Airport, which is nearby. So there's a few things that need to uh, uh, need to need to be able to put in place. Yeah. And as Eretik point out, it is a significant step forward that it's not user yeah. specific. Unlike all those bloody places in Scotland, <laughs> what a complete and utter freaking waste that is. Jeez. <laughs> anyway, right. Uh, next story, Johnny. More good news. Yeah. Yeah. So from Truro, um, we've had Graham's very kindly let us have some free landing vouchers in the past. Um, so Graham and Suzanne, who own and operate Truro Airfield, have finally received consent to build 17 holiday lodges on the site. Um, if you don't know, it's an all-grass airfield. It's located um, just west of Cornwall's only city. Um, and a revised plan was put in place earlier this year after the first one was thrown out, or rejected rather. Um, and it also, I spoke to Graham late summer about a landing fee and he said it all sounded good and things were ticking along there were just a few hurdles that had to be jumped and it turns out those were just increasing biodiversity on the site um, despite the fact there's a lake there um, so yeah it's, it's good news so you can you know potentially fly down there it's not going to affect the airfield in any way the airfield will still be operating as it is but there's bike sheds there you can rent kayaks you can actually stay there so that's good news. And to answer Peter's question, which I'm guessing is related to the picture we just threw up, yeah, um, it's completely off, a few hundred yards away from from that um, diagram of the lodges. So yeah, it's the, the, the runway safe. If you bought a lodge, could you taxi over to your back garden, <laughs> or could you squeeze not. a float plane onto that lake? <laughs> <laughs> not sure that goes with the biodiversity, uh, Johnny. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. When you look at that picture, I'm not. Uh, uh, what do you reckon they are? are? They fish or kayaks in the water there, or sharks? They'll be big fish. Big fish. <laughs> Probably are kayaks. They? Probably kayaks. Probably kayaks. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Well, there's quite a lot of them on the ground as well, aren't there? I don't know what they are. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm not sure you can buy the lodge eds. I think they're all for rent. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, I might have to be wrong. So, maybe we could have a bit of a fly out. We could get a little barbecue be going. Who knows? Mm. Mm. I'll pick you up some of the biodiversity there. Excellent. Right. Um, next. Nick Allen's Very come good. up with some biodiversity alligators. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. Talking mm. of let's let's continue the good news, I think, with yeah. Ed. With some old serum news, because a new revised master plan for old serum has been published. Uh, and uh, it's available for public, public consultation until the 5th of April. Um, the owners of the airfield have been in a long battle with local councils to come up with a way to develop the site, retaining the heritage and keeping flying operations. Uh, key to making the airfield viable, according to the owners and developer, is to build some housing. Uh, and in the new plan, the number of dwellings is reduced from 480, that's a chunky number, to 315. Uh, clearing one uh, area close to the airfield and to retain its open character. Uh, another area will transform the airfield for the 21st century with modern state-of-the-art buildings, according to the master plan. Um, initial ideas suggest the buildings on the site will, uh, could take influence from the aerodynamics of aviation, uh, and there could be a main flying hub designed to follow the curvature in, of an aeroplane wing. Um, in addition to the aviation facilities, the historic core will be refurbished in line with proposed management plan and conservation management uh, to create an important hub for historic air aircraft. And there's a summary which says um, one of the, some of the benefits uh, safeguarding the asset, obviously, uh, new facilities created for local residents as well as aviation users, um, high quality housing, new recreational walking routes. And an exciting destination, but for heritage aircraft. So, you know, I think if you were in a 152, they might go, you're not very heritage. Well, actually, clearly you are on the basis of age, but it's sounding like, is that going to be, you know, you know, vintage aeroplanes only? It's a it's a funny it's a funny thing, isn't it? I mean, because old serum is, is is kind of pretty local for us down, down in the West Country, and it it's but I don't know. It, it well, the fact that at the moment it's only it's it's. If you look at the PPR thing on the website, it says open to commercial aircraft only. So, okay. which is a bit strange. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I I I hope we don't lose the runway. I hope it becomes a a successful site for everyone concerned, yeah. and I hope that everybody can fly in. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't become some kind of like slightly strange place that one day someone goes, oh, you know what? This is not really making us any money. But, uh, anyway. Mm -hmm. let's let's just keep our fingers crossed and take that as positive i think is will be the will be the best bit so that's like how many positive stories is that we've had we've had three Turbid and Elmet, we've had truro three positive stories yeah unfortunately i feel you're about to break our hat trick <laughs> i'm about to yeah it's it's going to be we're going to have to leave it at a hat trick which is pretty good to get three positive airfield stories in a week though so i've got a couple of not so good ones um, first one, people may have seen some stuff on social media about Farway Common. Farway put in for some for a certificate of lawful use for, for, for various bits and pieces. And it, the good news is it was granted. The bad news is it was granted. Thank you very much, Ed. It was granted for the hangar. Um, and it was not granted, uh, in fact, for, for the runways, which is a little bit awkward. It seems that someone in the council has dug up uh, an enforcement notice from... I don't know, twenty odd years ago or something like that, that that clearly wasn't enforced, that no one really knew about, and who knows where they found that or what it wasn't searchable or anything. Anyway, I'll be talking to the people at Far Away. They are uh, taking advice. They'll be in touch soon. I'm sure they'll be providing us lots of news. There, there, there's it's not all doom and gloom. There is hopefully a way forward. From there does seem to be a bit of a situation developing there so let's hope that that yeah. is fixed um that's a because that's a great destination and the second bad news which people know about uh, already is is, is rougham as it stands at the moment rougham estates have basically decided not to renew the lease um and the last day for any activity there if nothing changes between now and then is the end of may um there's there's an awful lot of local interest it's going to take a huge amount of of money effort and, and finding somewhere for a start if you move all the activity there to somewhere else to relocate is certainly not easy um and there, there's radio stuff going on tomorrow there, there's all sorts of petitions and everything else so they're, they're pushing back quite hard on this um and, and rough mistakes have said that they want the they want the land 
back effectively for agricultural purpose with a development option. Um, so there you go. Um, we'll see what happens there. So good luck to the people at Ruffham. We will keep you up to date with uh, information as and when we get it. Um, it's a situation that's changing quickly. And they certainly, if, if, if all activity does cease on the end of May, it won't be because they haven't had a bloody good go at keeping it going. And I think, as Johnny said, uh, I'm not a lawyer. And I, I suspect that the people involved will be exploring all of their avenues, Paul. Um, I would, I would think so, but then my legal opinion is is completely worthless, which is about what you've all paid for it. Um, so there you go. Um, but yeah, so let, let's hope. Anyway, back back to Ruffham. Uh, there's free landing fee, I think, in Ruffham for the month of April. So if you haven't been, uh, month of April is the time to go and uh, and you never know, get, show them your support. Go along there, buy some whatever it is you can buy. That would be good. Right, uh, he's swiftly switches back to see what the next news story is. It's another airfield story. It's coming out of our ears. Yeah. Yep, yep. This is about uh, RF Scampton. It's been in the news, so you probably know much of this story already. The plan was when the RAF leave at the uh, finally leave at the end of March, uh, the local council was going to take it over and build a heritage centre and they planned to keep flying operations there. Uh, that has kind of been ripped up a bit at the moment because at the very, it's a bit of a coincidence. You kind of think the council knew about this announcement coming, but the Home Office has said it, they may open uh, an asylum centre there for people coming across in, in boats across the channel. Um, so it, it, they've not confirmed that it's definitely going to happen. The council's kind of in stuck in in middle of nowhere at the moment. However, um, there has been a bit of a leak in that uh, some ads, <coughs> excuse me, some ads have been spotted being placed by Serco, a government a home office contractor, looking for staff to run uh, an asylum centre uh, in near Lincoln, which is where Scampton is. So there's a bit of a there's a bit of a feeling that there, Scampton has been a bit more of a done deal than the home office is mentioning. But it's quite as, as Ian said, it's been, it's, 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 people are kicking back. There's a huge campaign, uh, not only from the locals. The local council is you know, definitely wants this heritage centre to go ahead. It's in a very rural area of Lincolnshire, not a lot of industry. This could really help. And uh, a bunch of historians have written an open letter to the uh, uh, Secretary of State, Suella Braverman, signed by 40 historians and various interested people trying to save Scampton on its historical basis. Yeah, uh, So there's a lot going on. This is a story that's going to run for a while yet, I think. Unfortunately, there's also a couple of national politicians who jumped on the bandwagon for their own, to their own end, the little... Gets yep. the sooner they go away, the better. Um, but anyway. Paul Wheel says you could. I could see my old married quarter. I don't think any any asylum seeker would like it. Paul, I don't. I, 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 I think the, the plan is that that if it happens, that, that it's going to be accommodation containers, isn't it? Dropped on the runway. So uh, yeah. What? Yeah. Why would you have to put them on the runway? I well, guess because lorries can drive there easily to put drop them off. It's interesting. The road access is not particular, not amazing there, um, and uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, let's be if we're positive about it. If the if the jobs are for near Lincoln, there's an there's an awful lot of disused runways and and disused old airfields and stuff around Lincolnshire where they could just as easily uh, find somewhere rather than Scampton. But you know, I don't I don't know. I don't know. I suspect there's a whole load of stuff going on under the surface that we're not privy yep. to there. Yeah. Um, and, I'm I'm sure we'll find out sooner or later. All right, let's let's. We've done airfields. We've done airfields to yes. death. It's how time about, to do some how about, aviation. How about some engine news? Engine news. Let's go for the engine news, Ed. Okay. So uh, so last week it was Bose teasing what we think will be a new headset. Uh, this week it's the turn of Rotax, and uh, that's right, the Aus the Austrian engine manufacturer, um, with hints of a new engine reveal at Sun and Fun, which opens next week. It's been nearly eight years, surprisingly, since Rotax gave us the 141 horsepower 915 IS. And in recent years, if you knew where to look, there were hints that a more powerful 916 version was in the works. Um, for instance, it's been flying on an Israeli drone called the Heron, where it's no doubt accumulated thousands of hours of uh, in-service experience, which is good from a point of view for your product testing. And you may remember just last year on the live stream, Mike Bly from Sling Aircraft was talking about um, air, you know, engines and airplanes and things like that. And uh, 
just completely freely admitted that they were testing a 916 on one of their slings as well. Um, well, this week, Rotax has, has begun teasing the new model with glimpses in short video clips, and it's definitely going to be the 916 IS. And we can tell you some details because the engine's actually already EASA certified, and the documents, if you go searching for them online, can be found. Uh, so the headline news is that it's 159 horsepower for three minutes only, then 135 horsepower max continuous, all the way up to 23,000 feet. Uh, weight looks like it's going to be the same as the 915 IS at 82 kilograms. As to price, your guess is as good as mine. I think the current 915 IS is around about £38,000. So the new 916 seems likely to probably come in north of 40k, I'm guessing. So um, JMB Aviation, who make the VL3 microlight, um, they posted it online this week that they've got a 916 and a VL3. And they're going to show that aeroplane at aero. And I suspect there will be a few other manufacturers uh, that will reveal things there. So one thing's for sure, though, we'll know more when they make the, the official announcement next week. Yeah, I, I should say the picture of the 916 that, that I I made here and the one that Ed made here are basically 915 ASs with a little bit of Photoshop Yes. To, and I, the I, I, to make it a 916. I, I removed my intercooler because it wasn't clear how they're going to arrange that. You just left the 915 intercooler on yours. so uh, It says 916. Anyway, and the, and the, other, the other thing I discovered while I was looking for Rotax pictures on the web was, was the long forgotten 120 degree V6 300 horsepower engine, which they yeah. made. Uh, this engine was built, was certified. Um, and so as soon, as soon as it was certified, the project got canned. Um, so who knows whether I'm, I'm kind of wondering whether having gone through all that expense and hassle and getting it certified, it's, it's it, I, I wouldn't be surprised one day if that got resurrected, modernized a bit and found its you way into a... I think so. I, it, it seemed certain that that was going to end up in a series of, you know, it's, and it just flashed the picture up. I mean, what a great looking piece of kit that was. So... Yep. And you just know, yeah. Rotex, it would have been quite sophisticated as well. So, um, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, right. From new engines that, and, and anything else that will almost undoubtedly be revealed at Sun and Fun next week and revealed at Aero in Friedrichshafen a couple of weeks after that. Oh, Johnny's oh, gone. Johnny's gone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we've also got some other. Some other bits of news, um, but we think I don't think we got round to allocating who was going to do this. So, who wants well, to go? Do you, want to, do you want to flash the pictures up one by one, and I'll tell you what they oh, really are. What they so in in our running order, viewers. It says it's it's slightly it's slightly rude. It's it says weird stuff of the month, but it doesn't. There's there's a different word for uh, <laughs> it's that stuff. stuff is spelt differently. <laughs> and we're feeling this week that there's we've got some exceptionally weird stuff. So let's flash a picture up. How about this? Yes, I, yeah. To be fair, you would go, that's pretty weird, but I know what's coming next. So this looks pretty <laughs> normal. This is basically an edgely optica, isn't it, that's been stretched at the front a bit? It is a little bit, isn't it? Here comes yeah. Johnny. Um, well, so what's what's yeah, the news about that, Dave? Well, this is the Cormorant seaplane. It's yeah. been developed uh, uh, by a Scandinavian bunch. Um it could be made of wood, they say, which I think is pretty weird. <laughs> um, there's, yeah. there's one big electric, one big fan at the back. Um, it's, it's it's supposed to be big. It's quite a big aircraft uh, with a maximum speed of 220 knots, cruise of 180 knots, a maximum takeoff weight of 2,250 kilos. This is a big aircraft. Uh, and a payload of 875. They're talking about a hydrogen fuel cell powertrain with a max power of 520 kilowatts. That's almost 700 horsepower. That's it, yeah. It kind of it looks like the water's going to go in the fan. To be yeah. fair, yeah. I know. <laughs> it does a bit, doesn't it? It's like, yeah. Well, oh, that's not gonna that's not gonna go well, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Andrew Kennedy says we're going to need a jingle for this weird stuff of the month. Mm. We are. Weird. You're right. You do. <clears throat> what else? What else is in the weird stuff of the week show? Do you think? Do you think we? On that, on that jingle front, do you think we should all get together around a microphone and do one of those barbershop quartet radio jingle things? Weird no, stuff of the month. No, weird stuff no, of no. the month. No? <laughs> no. Do you want to think about that or is it just a no? <laughs> it's just a no. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Let's have a look. Next thing we got. Oh, this is a. I'm sorry, but this is absurd. 
Yeah. And we, uh, Jess, so this was unveiled. This is this has come to light this week. It's um, it's a project from Light, and they're saying this is going to be a forty seat. Um, Eve, no, it's a forty seat turbine VTOL, isn't it? Because they've gone, yep. oh no, electric motors and stuff. That's not going to be a thing. We're just going to use regular turbines. I mean, who's ever? I mean, you look at the size of the propellers on that. I think they're using. I think they're using both. I think they're using turbines and electric motors powered by. Yeah, I, well, I think there's an option, isn't there, for electric yeah. in the future? But this, I, I'm going to say it. But it, and have we got the other photo that just looks okay. even more absurd? Uh, the only other yeah, one we got. Is I, honestly, this, <laughs> this this looks like looks like some kids came up with this. This looks like Playmobil designed an aeroplane um, and went, you know, as a, as a kid's toy, maybe. I will, I will, I'll donate a substantial amount to Ian if, <laughs> if they actually managed to, because they're talking, of, they're talking of um, having this ready to fly in like two years, aren't they? And I, no, like three, three years I'm, of R&D, you've already gone into it. I, I'm pretty sure that those, the wingtip engines are the electric ones, and the rest are four PT six. Four, four. I haven't said PT six. It's four established, four yeah, turbines yeah. from an established manufacturer running on sustainable aviation fuel. I just, so uh, I like. I, with all this stuff, it's like, do they think of actually? Do, does does some kind of AI program just randomly sketch aircraft designs for crazy people, or does it actually? It can't take into account any. It's like I'm what. But surely people go. Where does the spa go? Where are people going to sit? Where where is all the systems going to go? And what, uh, actually, oh, hang on. What? Why is that over a rail yard? Because it's <laughs> kind of a, it's it's a disruptor to the train industry, apparently. <laughs> well, the interesting thing when you look at this picture, I thought that that spa for the for the four plane is going to is basically running through the cockpit, and that is clearly the pilots, if there are any pilots, are going to be sitting on that spa. And then you look at this, and you go, oh, well, when, it's when it takes off, it, it kicks the pilots off of the spa. <laughs> <laughs> it, just okay, makes, it, it just makes no sense. But the, the, this this really riled us up, didn't it? Because it, this, it, it did. this, this we got, led to some in Well, we got two more. We got, we got this one. Don't forget this oh, yeah. one. Well, this, yep. uh, I mean, this, 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 I reckon, is actually pretty damn normal. Mm. It looks standard. It look, almost looks like a widgeon compared to the others. I, I, mm. I like that. That looks really nice. Well, this is produced by a company called Jectar, uh, and apparently the people there are also involved in a, a, in a normally powered amphibian called the LA-8, which I think we've seen at Aero in the past. Okay. Uh, this is this is called the Phase 100, <laughs> of course. 19 passengers or mixed cargo and passenger things. It's all composite. Electric power with 10 motors, apparently. Um, okay. And it's going to have a maximum of one hour rate, uh, endurance with a 30 minute reserve. But uh, again, okay. all that exists really at the moment is, um, is this. Is it? So I just, want to ask, I just want to ask people out there, um, particularly if you've flown a multi engine aeroplane, look at the tail on that. Oh, where's it gone? Yeah. Look at the tail on that aeroplane and, and imagine some asymmetric thrust. You've probably got a big old chunky tail there, haven't you? Yes. Then look at the tail on this aeroplane. <laughs> and you might just that yeah, that, I, that I is, think I think one aeroplane's been designed by people who know about aviation, and the other the the other aeroplane has been designed by the kids who did the Bryce Norton Aerospace. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then and then we got the then we got the Volt Twenty Thirty. Ah, well, there's a, there's a bit of a curveball, isn't it? This is you decided that you needed into the eVTOL industry, so this is your proposal, isn't it, for eVTOL? Well, I basically I just went onto an an AI generation program and said, "Draw me an electric aircraft, please." And this is what it came back with. You <laughs> know, which is fair, that looks more realistic than the uh, the device from Light. It's not bad. Yeah. And then I got onto Chat GPT and said, "Write me an investment prospectus, please." Yeah, and so and that was churning away, but I got bored waiting, to be honest. And it did one of that, and then, and and then miraculously, this managed to turn up as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We don't know who's created that, but um, maybe that's being a bit more honest. It, it, it wasn't. It, it wasn't me. I'm not sure we should have done that, but perhaps we should move on at that point. <laughs> Dave's nervous. 
<laughs> Wipe that from your mind, people. Wipe that from your mind. Right. I think on that basis, it is probably time to head over to our interview. So let's excuse me while I just do a little bit of screen fumbling here. There you go. There you go. Don probably Mikey. Hello. Hi, Mikey. How are we, guys? Hello. <laughs> We're very good. Thank you, Mike. Thank, thanks for joining us, Mikey. So, um, yeah, tonight we're joined by Mikey. And I, I do. Pr McMahon? McMahon? Yeah. McMahon? yeah, yeah. Do you know what? I'll take anything. I've heard that many variants of it over the years. I'll just take anything. <laughs> well, there's there's two more. Um, <laughs> AKA the Flying Irishman, who um, fires Michael out. He's run his own podcast, YouTube channel. Uh, he's a volunteer with Spitfires.com as well. Um, and also presumably has a day job as well, which I think is for a, a major airline. Um, indeed, yeah. So let's let's have a quick chat about Spitfires first. Um, yeah. So you're you're a volunteer, yeah. Which I get from the looks of it, it, it looks a bit like being an F1 pit crew. Is it is it like that, or is it something else entirely? Um, no, it, it, it's a bit like that, except we don't get as much involved as the F1 pit crew. We have a whole team of engineers that do that for us, and we just stand there and look pretty when it, when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, a day-to-day -day thing for us would be we'd meet the customer, bring them through to the gear room, we'd get them kitted out with a suit, um, helmet, gloves, we'd give them their brief and life jackets, uh, then we'll strap them into the aircraft, go through all the safety features, um, what happens if the pilot needs to do emergency actions and stuff like that, and um, just bring them through their, their whole journey with, with the Spitfire. We send them off, they go and have a good time, we'll grab a cup of tea, and then when the Spitfire comes back, we'll um, get them unclipped from the aircraft and the parachute, get them back in and de kitted and uh, send them on their merry way. And is that quite an intensive thing on a not nice hot summer day? Yeah, it can be. When it, when it was really hot last year, um, I remember we were taking turns of sitting in the gear room in the uh, in the aircon because it was it was quite warm because you, you were wearing your your flight suits as well um and it, it can be it can be quite intense but it, you, you look cool so it's just that's the main thing you just get you through it <laughs> <laughs> see what Does i mean looking... i rest my case <laughs> <laughs> In fact, what, what, what's the medal medal around your neck there oh so there's there's a story to that so just to the right i was shot there was um uh, it was a kind of like a bar that was set up. So that's a Goodwood Revival. Um, but you were only allowed in there if you owned a Rolex. Now, I, I don't own a Rolex, but they had a pair of camels and I really wanted to see the camels. And um, they wouldn't let me in to see the camels. And I tried all weekend to get in and see these camels and no one was having any of it until eventually one of the camel owners gave me the medal to go in and see the camels. And then I just got to keep it after because they went home. <laughs> it's a bit like Crufts. I could I could have said it's a bit like Crufts and got I got best in show or something. I don't know. It's <laughs> when when you say camels, do you mean like is that a name for is there like a specific Rolex watch called a camel or something? I don't think so. It was it was done up like an Egyptian um kind of tomb thing, but you needed a, a Rolex to get in. Um, Are they real camels? Yeah, yeah, they were real. <laughs> Learn something every day. <laughs> I, I did double take when I was stood there in the morning. We we pushed Gertie out onto the onto the pan, and um, these two camels walked past, and I did do a double take. Cause it, <laughs> what? <laughs> this is one of the most bizarre weekends I've ever had. <laughs> Thinking some strange stuff. There's another picture of you here. <clears throat> yeah, that was good fun. That was on the way back uh, from Leon Solent, heading to Goodwood at the end of Festival of Speed. Uh, repositioning the aircraft back to back to Goodwood to start flight operations from there again. Nice. So, have you had one trip in Spit or or a few? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then got to taxi it a few times as well, which has been really cool. Um, Gilda mainly, and then had a go of a uh, BS four ten as well that we have, uh, and it was kind of my first. Oh, I've been in many, many tail draggers, um, but it's kind of the first thing that I've ever been given. Oh, here you go. Um, I'm shadowing the controls in the front. You take them at the back. Um, and it's the, the first kind of, in, kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Instruction into tail dragging. And it was an eye opener to me. I don't know. I've heard the war stories about Spitfire's been pigs on the ground. And I don't know if it was just because it was um, a pig on the ground or if it was just me being really bad with tail draggers. But uh, she was quite... Uh, tricky, I think, is the word to use to to taxi. Mm -hmm. Wow! Yeah. Well, there have been a few occasions when when they've not gone when it's not gone quite to plan, hasn't it? When it's been taxiing. And I did, I've seen I a couple of videos. 
Yeah. Ed, you'll remember this. Like years and years and years ago, I'm pretty sure because there was a guy at our gliding club who was involved in it. This, this is like a long, I haven't been gliding for decades. Yeah. Was it Rolls yeah. Royce Spitfire that was doing an engine run that kind of turned it, tipped on its nose? It has a, a ground, ground running Spitfires is fraught with danger because they obviously, you've got a lot of power and they, they will very easily go on their nose. And you do need to make sure they're strapped down. And people, people have had engine have have had spitfires go on their nose you know inadvertent too much power comes off the comes off the tail and i've yeah i've heard of it happening a, a few times i knew someone who a long long time ago um knew someone who had one and did something exactly like that and it was a new propeller and an engine stripped down so wow. that's gonna be a bad day so you haven't done you haven't done that yet then mikey no, and I have no intentions. I'm very lucky that we I've got, I've got some of the, the best instructors that I know of to, to um, help me through that kind of phase with it uh, every time um, I get a go of that. So, yeah, I don't think there will be any fear of that happening anytime soon. So, so be, before we know it, by the end of the season, Mike, you'll, you'll have done your tail wheel conversion and it'll, you'll be the first person to have done it on a, straight on a Spitfire. <laughs> I'm not sure about that now. I think I yeah. might start smaller. <laughs> Talk, talking of which, and sorry to interrupt you a little bit there, but I'm diverging off. I don't know if anyone remembers European Flyers at, at Blackbush run by a guy called Tony Holden. But uh, towards the end of European Flyers' existence, because it, it, it kind of went out, sadly went out of business, um, Tony had a DC-3, which may or may not have been linked to it going out of business. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But um, he, that was that was what he did his tailwheel conversion from, uh, from, from, from nose wheel aircraft onto tailwheels on his DC-3. Wow. Wow. So, wow. There you go. Anyway, well, we should probably move on from that. Back to you, Mikey. Sorry. Over to you, Johnny. Yeah. Um, so passengers, I've always wondered, and we, we've had a few Spitfire pilots on from various outfits across the country, but um, you know, they kind of just get in and fly the thing, but you probably interact with them more. Are they all super wealthy or are they actually like normal people who are spending a shit of money of their own money to have an amazing experience? It's really weird. You meet different people of all walks of life. Um, I've, met, I've met veterans, uh, and uh, again, I've, I've met people who have a, a shed load of money who, who just want to fly in a Spitfire. Um, I would say that 90% of the people that, that I meet and have the pleasure of meeting are people who have some sort of connection to the Spitfire. Their dads flew them in the war or, or their uncles. So there, there's some connection there. Um, so we do see quite a few people coming through like that uh, who just either want to have a good time with a Spitfire or have a, a, a genuine emotional connection to it and want to want to just fly it again and, and see what their relative or loved one had, had gone through. Mm. And I've got to ask, do people throw up in them often? <laughs> do you know what? It's not as common as, as you think. I think in my whole season last year, I dealt with two, two vomits, I think it was. Um, and that that was it. it. It's it's not. You do get people coming down who, who need a second just to kind of chill out and say, same same as you would do if you weren't used to aerobatics normally. Um, and most people, if you if you're in a Spitfire, I think the, the general consensus is you ha you have to do something in it to go upside down. Um, there's no like I don't think anyone could could live with themselves afterwards. Been like, oh, do you want to go upside down Spitfire? We're like, nah, I'm all right. You, 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 it's a general consensus of everyone you speak to goes, oh yeah, I don't like aerobatics, but I'll do a lot in one of them. Um, so yeah, it, it doesn't happen that often, but I have seen it happen twice. I think is the, is the only times I've dealt with it. Mm. What's the general reaction from people? Because I've, I've, you know, the cliche is people land and they're in tears and that kind of thing. But what, you know, what 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 emotions do people actually experience? We we have a thing called the Spitfire grin, and it's one that stays there for. I'm still smiling now. Um, it, it's people just they genuinely you do get people come down in tears um because like i said they have the emotional connection to it they've just seen what their loved ones or, or, or family members has, has got to experience but um they come down and they're they're either in tears or there's just there's always just this smile that goes around the back of the head and around the forehead and stuff it's just you cannot stop smiling afterwards and it's great to see what they're buzzing they're absolutely buzzing and i always say to people at the end of it they could fly on saturday and i'll say to them you'll be you'll be buzzing till wednesday now and it's mainly true that they'll go away and be like, yeah, I know, I can already feel it. And off they bounce out the door really, really happy with themselves and grinning like a Cheshire cat. <laughs> so I've got a couple of other pictures here. What's, what's, what's ah. that? <laughs> yeah. So I, I was very, very lucky to be invited to go and fly the Shark uh, Microlite in Portugal in 2021, I think it was October 2021. 
Um, and that one, that was at the factory la this day last year, actually. Um, and we managed with one in Portugal owned by a, a very good family friend of ours. And he was like, oh, we'll go up and have a, have a spin in the airplane. It's like, brilliant. So hopped in the back, off we went. And uh, they own a flight school as well. And they happened to have a load of land Africa's that were doing circuits at the time. And these guys apparently are just so used to Paolo coming through and intercepting them that we just came up, sat beside him for a bit, waved at him, made funny faces at each other, and then just blasted off. Um, and it's amazing to see. He's about to turn left base there. Um, and it was amazing to see as Paolo put the power back on uh, how quickly he disappeared behind us and how quickly the shark accelerated. Mm -hmm. Oh. So, so you're not. I think I think I'm right in saying I, I just I wondered looking at that whether you were the UK agent, but there was some news about that. Have we got Ed, Ed, or, Ed or Dave? Yeah. Or remember the UK agent was announced as uh, the light aircraft company, wasn't it? Up at um, it was, yeah, uh, little snoring. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's them. Um, great bunch from what I've I've never met them, but from what I've I've seen on social media and chatted to them a few times, so it seemed like a great bunch. Um, I'd love to see it over here. If I, if I had the money, I'd have one over here in a heartbeat. Um. Yeah, there's just that little hitch in my plan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So join the club. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought, no, mind you, you, you got one of your YouTube videos that's got like a ridiculous amount of YouTube video views flying out, flying a little boy or something like that. Oh, yeah. So that's my little brother. Uh, we flew out of Carnal Aviation in um, where I learned to fly in Northern Ireland. And uh, one day there was fights in my house. My dad wanted to fly them for the first time. And lucky enough, when the day came, I was the only one that could actually fly the C-42 at the time. And um, I said, just, just for fun, just threw him in. He's got a rare condition called William syndrome. And um, so one of the side effects of that is he's, he's always happy. He doesn't know any other emotion other than happy. Um, but it was he got this really sensitive hearing um, that you could blow a, a dog whistle and humans aren't meant to hear it. And he'll cover his ears um so i was a little bit worried on startup whether or not it would hurt his ears so we put him in i had to get his booster seat out of the car and then strap him into the right hand seat because he couldn't see out the window otherwise um so we did that i brought him for a taxi down the runway he did a full power taxi back up he was happy enough so we went flying um one thing i loved about kernan was that you'd either at the time when i was flying there anyway it was one way in one way out and um, so we taxed up top of the hill, turned around, took off. And as you take off, you got willow trees going past. And then Reef is a farmer as well. So it was like one of these unique airfields where it was just a bit of hardcore middle of the field. And you could have asparagus one side of it and then the willow trees the other side and up the hills. And you'd come out of it, do a 180 around, or how I did it was you'd do a 180 around uh, Tantric Inn and come back in. So that was a route I was going to do with Robbie. Um, and I just, I didn't think anything of it. I just put the GoPro in more than for, for a bit of fun and for the family to see and everything. And off we went and um uploaded it we landed he loved it uploaded to youtube that that night uh, next morning i woke up it hadn't hadn't got that many views uh, but by the time i got to work it had just gone absolutely mental um it had two and a half thousand views in the 20 minutes that i drove to work that day and then it just rolled on and on i think uh, over facebook youtube uh, lad bible got hold of it and everything and it, it's now sitting at something like 11 and a half to 12 million views which has been absolutely unbelievable hmm. That must that must be close to paying for your Spitfire. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I thought I thought I'd be in the money. I didn't do that well over really. <laughs> but I think that's a, that's an absolute joy of flight video. That isn't it? He's uh, he's he's like just laughing all the time, isn't he? He is, and it was amazing because I, I was more worried than uh, than I think he was, and I think Dad was a bit nervous because as I went to shut the door, Dad came over and he was like. Don't let anything happen. My favorite son's on board. And I was like, oh, thanks, Dad. You went, no, it's not you. And shut the door. I was like, oh, cheers. <laughs> but um, as, soon as, we, as soon as we took off, it was a little bit of nerves, I think, on my behalf, just because I didn't want to scare him. Because if he was scared, it would take you, what, about two minutes to reconfigure the aircraft to get back into land. And it would be the longest two minutes of his little life. And I, I, I didn't want that at all. Um, and I think that was a bit of nerves. But like you said, as soon as the, the wheels took off, he just he was so so happy about it and just happy to be there and because of that my nerves melted away and the two of us we just went for a nice lovely le leisurely flight um right it's, it's two two brothers and absolutely he loved it and he's done quite a few flights since which has been amazing and the other thing was is that it got william syndrome out there which was a quite a, a rare condition and, and mm -hmm. put, put that on the map which has been amazing for the mo thing i think i'm most proud of is that fantastic brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. fantastic story well, yeah cool well, 
Will, Will floods that at Kernan Aviation. Well worth a visit. Fly the C forty two in and out of all the tricky tight strips in Northern Ireland. Is fabulous, underrated fun. I completely agree with him. C forty two is a lot to be said for a C forty two. There we go. And that, that, I think that's just, Johnny. Found, you found the link for that. Yeah. Yeah. Put it in there. Worth watching because um, it is. It's uh, one of those fabulous moments in aviation where you see how flying just makes people happy. So. Brilliant. It's, in, it's infectious. I've never, I've never known any other kind of sport or anything in life that'll get into people's blood as much as aviation does. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I don't know. Have we got any questions in the in the comments? Or, or? Um, there Time is is certainly marching on. Yeah, Cloud Hopper says, "Michael, love your videos. I've got a burning question. I wanted to ask you, please. You landed at a small airfield near Selsey, Bognor Regis. In one of your videos, is it possible to PPR?" Um, I think it is. Um, it was CFI of Flight Sport Aviation who I flew with uh, at the time uh, for that video. He arranged it all. It was it was kind of part of a strip skills course, so he was arranging it all. Um, but I can definitely, if you send me a message on Instagram or YouTube or wherever you, you, you follow, um, just give me a shout and I'll see if I can get the information for you. Very good. And I think there's another one there. Stephen Rolls says, which must be about the whole operating in the Spitfire environment. How do you make yourself heard? <laughs> I, me, I've no problems with that, really. Uh, I've been told by that lot that I've got a very uh, voice that carries. Um, but you do have a uh, one of the unique things on takeoff with the Spitfire is uh, we've got to turn off the comms because of the Merlin engine on takeoff um, just because it's so loud. Uh, you can't hear the pa passenger talk on takeoff. Um, oh, you can hear them scream, but you can't hear them talk. So it's, it's usually <laughs> when you throttle back just after takeoff, the, the comms will get switched back uh, over so you can have a chat normally. It's about, yeah, special, kind of like what the RAF have helmet wise, noise cancelling and stuff. And even that can't drown out the noise of the Merlin. It's an animal. Yeah. And uh, and last question Life of Cars says, what's the best thing working at, working at Spitfires.com? Um, my favorite thing for I think is the best is. One one of the ones that hits home, we do a we do a thing called Formation Friday, which is where we we'd get uh, a load of uh, different flights booked in, so uh, fly, fly formations with them. And I walked into the hangar one, I think it was last July, July or August, and I walked into the hangar and there's five airworthy Spitfires just sat there, and the smell of the hangar as well when you walked in. And I thought, <laughs> how else? I was pinching myself, but I was also afraid to pinch myself in case I woke up. And it was just one of those things of. <laughs> I'm so privileged and so lucky to do this. How many people in the world? I know there's people who book flights, but how many people in the world actually get to get to be around the Spitfires as much as I do, and and get to spend time with them and get trusted with them? And that was that's one of the things that I count my lucky stars when I'm driving home from Goodwood or Lee every every time I'm finished a weekend or, or a day down there. Fantastic, brilliant, Mikey. Thank you very very much for coming along. It's been a pleasure. Great stories. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on a strip somewhere, maybe in a C-42, maybe in a shark, maybe in a Spitfire. Who knows? Um, <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. It's been, a, it's been a privilege. Have a great one. It's been brilliant. Yeah, so it must be time for... Ed wins. You accidentally the picked the Ed Wins one, didn't you? <laughs> I did. I did. Well, let's 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 see if you do, Ed. Let's see if you do. Uh, who knows? Um, so this week we decided to pick our favourite beach craft, but there's a proviso. You couldn't pick the uh, the stagger wing. That's right. No stagger wings. Because <laughs> no. it's just too obvious. It's too obvious and easy, yeah. Um, and yeah. surely enough, someone early, right at the start of the show... Where I've tried it? to find it, Ed, as well. <laughs> no, I should have marked it because oh. someone oh. said... Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? I can hear. Wow, there's a lot of comments. Blimey. There is a lot. It's a, it's a heavy commenting night tonight. It, it started mm. even before the show. Nothing to do with us. I think everyone's just got lots to say. Yeah, no, I <laughs> give up. I give up. But there was um, someone said, I bet it'll be a stagger wing. Oh, there we go. Nick <laughs> Allen. Is it going to be Ed or Ian who chooses a stagger wing? Neither of us, because we Neither. know the rules. Uh, so who's uh, first? Dave is first. I'm just desperately looking for his airplane, which I'm struggling to find at the moment. It's there. I know it's, it's there. there. Well, I, I've, you might think this there is a boring option, but it's not. It's probably the most famous type of beach, the, the beach type 35 V-tail. This isn't just any old 
Type 35, though. This is uh, November 4560 Victor. It's a 1948 Type 35, only a year after they started making them. There's a great story, apart from the fact it looks fantastic, there's a great story attached to this aircraft. The current owner, Scott Crane, first flew in it as a six-year-old in 1968 when his uncle owned it. The aircraft was sold in 1993 when his uncle lost his medical, sat unused in a barn for 20 years. Scott found it, bought it and restored it. it took him seven years to restore it. Quite a lot of, um, a lot of work required to fuse large and things. They uh, fitted a nearly new engine, updated the panel, but resisted a full glass cockpit because he wanted to keep it as original as possible. And this is the beautiful thing that uh, he's produced. I've, I've got to say that that the super early Bonanza, because people forget that this was a ninety. This this was a new. This was kind of latest and greatest in nineteen forty seven, wasn't it? This mm. was like the Cirrus would have been in the in the in the mm. early noughties. Yeah. Do, do you think? Did everybody hate Bonanza drivers as well then? Well, I, <laughs> I think it was probably similar, wasn't it? But yeah. um, but mm. you know, just a, just a, a tremendous airplane. That is a great choice, Dave. Yeah. Yeah, not a, not a, not a bad choice. Ed, I'm going to make you go next. Oh, excellent! I do like that. So um, I, I I've I have got a stagger wing in my fancy hangar, but obviously no picking the stagger wing. Uh, but it was an easy beach for me because I went for the model 2000 Starship. Um, now it's remarkable to think that this the the whole project for this started back in 1979 when Beach were looking for a, a, the idea of a successor for the King Air. Um, in 1982, uh, they approached um, uh, Bert Rutan Scale Composites to develop a design, and he came up with a, an 85% proof of concept. It took ages to turn that into a full-scale um, starship, and that wouldn't come until 1986. And unfortunately, even though the starship is fantastic looking, it was all composite at a time when lots of stuff wasn't composite. So the FAA were really, uh, they were, very particular with certification and things like that. The aeroplane put on weight. It had a really, because it had flaps, the canard did clever things to move to very, you know, it had variable geometry canard. And um, anyway, Starship was over budget, over cost. And I think in my note, what was it at the time? The list price in 1989, by the time they were selling 3.9 million, uh, which was similar to the Citation 5 and the Lear 31. Um, and it just wasn't, but, you know, despite being, I think, wonderful and beautiful, it just wasn't a competitor for their for Beach's own product, which was the King Air. Um, mm. So they made, I think, it, I th total of something like fifty-two, and um, eventually they got bored. Mm. Beach got bored of supporting them, bought a whole bunch of them back, uh, and uh, chopped them up. And uh, there's just a handful left. So I think uh, uh, currently there's six flying starships. Um, but the owners who have them will protect all protect them fiercely. But I just think that's a beautiful. It's a it's a fantastic machine, and it's kind of it was inspirational for me because when I was a kid growing up, it was a poster I had on my wall of a beach starship. <laughs> <laughs> we had a bit of a conversation about posters on wall in live stream extra did, yesterday, didn't we? Mm. Yeah, so, that was a good one. Okay, so let's. I, I I'm, I'm going to jump in next. Um, so there was there, there was Dave's. Vital Bonanza, which is a great classic, but you know, it's a little bit vanilla, isn't it? And there was there was yeah. Ed's <laughs> Starship, which you know, which was which was futuristic at the time, but looks a little bit dated now, frankly. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> compared to like a, an Avanti or something. Um, mm. But yeah, anyway, I, I went for one. I went for one of these. This is the uh, T thirty, but it's actually called the T thirty four C. Turbo Mentor, even though it's a turbine, turbo prop engine in there. The early ones were piston engines. This particular one, the one I fancy, is actually the turbine. It's uh, it, it's Pratt and Whitney in there, demo to 400 shaft horsepower. It'll do 200 knots all day long. Well, until it runs out of gas, which is about 600 nautical miles. Top speeds a bit faster than that, 230 nautical miles. Still in service with NASA today. Um, I, I just think it'd be a fun tandem, throw it about, fast touring, fun, interesting airplane. I, I, I do mean, like the, T, the T34. Seems like a really cool little, you know, warbird, pseudo warbird. And you see loads of them mm. in the States, but you just don't see any of them over here. And it's, I'm one just of amazed. The T34s over here is, the, is, is one of the things I've always asked myself. 
Yeah, why? Um, I, I don't, there might be one or two in Germany, possibly, but it's like they've just never come across. So, yeah. Um, but it's, it seems like a cool little machine. It's like a Warbird Bonanza, mm. isn't it? It is. Yeah. Mm. It is. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so there you go. That's my... And then let's move over to Johnny. Yeah, so I got stuck on two. I, I'm going to pick one, but I'll show you the other one afterwards. So I've gone for the... Started out as the Model 26, which then became known as the AT10, um, which is basically almost like a, a baby Beach 18. And this is one of the... I think it was the only one with a VTEL, and this was a kind of developmental tail that led to the early VTEL Bonanzas. Um, so the airplane itself was just built as a um, multi-engined retractable trainer for the US Air Force in the came about in 1940 it first flew in 1941 there were nearly two and a half thousand built and of those two and a half thousand there's one in Dayton Ohio in the US Air Force Museum and there's one apparently under restoration somewhere um, by a company called Air Corps I think Air Corps Aviation yeah, in, um, in, but, in Bemidji, uh, wherever Bemidji is. Ian will know this. <laughs> Bemidji is in North Dakota. There we go, yeah. Uh, cold. Yes. So, yeah, yeah, uh, 8010, I think it's a cool-looking baby baby beach 18 with a with a nice VTEL. I've not got a picture of it on the ground, but it does look – it's got awesome ramp presence when it's sat with its big – Big radial sat up up front. And I realise the dates don't work, but it does look like the result of a threesome between a Beach 18, a Bonanza, and a Mars Gemini. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and interesting. So the 8010 uh, Wichita, which is Johnny's pick, um, in regular non VTEL format, actually, the, one of the reasons that there's not many of them around is that, mo that pretty much all the fuselage aft of the um, after the main cabin was wood. Yeah. Mm. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, and th that that was part of the U.S. Air Force's requirement because they didn't want anything that was going to be taking up, sucking up too much materials, expensive materials. Yeah. Um, right. So, Quick, we're running out of time, so let's get on with your other one then, Johnny. Yeah, this is just a curveball that that I just discovered last week, actually, completely irrespective of this fancy hangar. But this is the Model Thirty Four. Look at that. So it's basically no. a small commuter airliner with a V tail, <laughs> and in interestingly, it was called the Twin Quad. So it's got four Lycoming GSO 580s, which stood for geared. Um, I forgot what the S stood for. Now. <laughs> anyway, it's geared, so supercharged, hard. opposed, I think. So right. it was okay. two, engines, two engines buried in each wing, geared, powering the props. Um, and funnily enough, you can kind of see it from that picture. It was built to survive gear up landings. So it's actually got um, well, I a, don't... a couple of reinforced yeah. um skids that is that's that's supremely oddball yeah um, that is supremely oddball um needless to say it never came to anything it didn't work because nobody wanted it <laughs> talking talking of uh, beaches that never came to anything while i was searching for this you'll you'll recognize some of the more regular beachcraft things in this this is a photo from a, a 1962 um beach um sales agents uh, meeting at um beach H beach H hq there'll be an airplane in that picture that none of i bet no one will recognize um because there's actually uh, that turboprop twin is from so 1962 predated the king air by a number of years um, and Beach were actually planning to make this. It was the Model 120, and it had two um, uh, Turbo Mika turboprops. They made a uh, made a mock-up of it, which is what you see there, never decided to build it, and it would be mm. another 10-odd years before they came up with the King Air. looks a lot like a swearing and metro liner, I think. Mm. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah, but I'm, yeah. Bonkers that you could have a, something, a machine like that and the Beach A-Team as a current, as current project, as kind of, Current um, items on the um, on the on the production list. That must have looked so futuristic compared to the Beach 18. And yeah. the sales people must have got so excited about taking it back. But anyway. reckon, yeah. so what have we got in the comments then? In the comments, um, uh, so we have uh, what have we got? Uh, do, do, do. That was a lovely story, Dave, about your bonanza. Um, <laughs> Starship. What else we got? I'm trying to the, the, the comments go back quite a long way again. Um, life's a beach, someone was bound to say that. Eretique says, Who's second after Ed? Uh, 
Uh, Ian wins. That's Thank you, John. Just Johnny wins. Johnny wins. Tail wheel two. Ed loses. Marginal vote for Johnny over Ian's choice. Uh, there was a twin bonanza. Correct. Mm. Um, Johnny for me. Um, what else have we got? The uh, Chris Winch picks the eighty eleven Kazan. Um, Ed wins because Starship would have would have been my choice too. Um, Katkin says it's a draw. I'll go with Dave in the Bonanza. <laughs> Dave wins. Dave, um, yeah. All sorts. Yeah. Johnny has a bad eye for aesthetics. <laughs> 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 I, I suppose this might be. I mean, we haven't got time to discuss this now. Maybe, maybe there's there's room for a whole special at some point. Did have Beach built a bad aircraft? Um, probably not. Well, uh, I, when you look at look at the production list, it's been very rare. I need pro that you. I guess a lot of people would say, "Oh, the Starship was probably a not a success." It was, yeah. you know, it pushed a lot of things forward, but wasn't a commercial success. So, um, but Jim, yeah. I, I think Beach have probably had a lot have have had fewer. What, what you would call bad aeroplanes than anyone else. So yeah. they, they weren't very successful with their business jet, the Premier One. That was, That's uh, true. true. Ironically, uh, um, <coughs> when you bought, um, uh, if you were a Starship customer, to try and leverage you out of a Starship, because Beach One, when they were trying to buy them back, they were offering you premier ones and i wonder if that's because it's like oh so quick so sell these guys a premier one because we've got loads of those on the shelves as well <laughs> right dave what have we got in terms of stuff there seems to be loads of it going on well it's not this weekend but which is just as well given the weather but next weekend the 30th yep. of well the next week things start to kick off the whole season kicks off on the 30th of march there's a strange event called the gin flight and feast mm. at sherburn the uh, same evening, there's a, a Gasco safety evening at Goodwood, but then follow a, a, a bunch of fly-ins. We're back into flying territory. 1st of April, Sherwood Ranger flying. I've forgotten where it is, but anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's on the website. It's a little snoring. Uh, also on 1st of April, Eurofox flying at Popham. 1st of April, Private Flyer Fest at Western Airport in near Dublin. 2nd uh, of April, there's a helicopter and auto gyro flying at North Coates. So... The flying season starts. It's starting. Ooh, and a late brilliant. entry on the, on the bad beach crafts. A few people are going, the skipper. <laughs> yeah. Good. Right. I think uh, we, we've, we've run over by seven minutes, which is not too bad. We've done, we've done worse. We've done better, but we've done worse. So a big, big thank you to the whole team there. Thank you very much to everybody out there for watching. It's been a pleasure. We look forward to seeing you. I won't see you next Wednesday. I forgot to mention that team. I'm not around next Wednesday, uh, oh. but I'll be back on Thursday. Um, and Dave, I'll try and join you for the for the emceeing of the uh, William Plug Tales thing on Tuesday, but I probably won't make that either, to be perfectly honest. So have a great weekend, everybody. Enjoy your flying, enjoy the rain. If you've got nothing better to do and you happen to find yourself in Madrid, come and ha come along to Pilot Careers Live. We're at the NH Euro Building Hotel. See you there. Um, otherwise, see you all next week, and uh, we'll welcome in summer with longer days and, and yes. lovely sunshine everywhere. So see you all then. Thank you. Cheers all. Bye. Cheers.